guys, and welcome back to another one of our virtual backyard field trips. Uh, as you can see, we have one of our great friends here, Frank Robb, uh, known as the alligator catcher, and he's uh, talking to some of our little American alligator hatchlings here today. Uh, today we'll be discussing all about reptiles and amphibians and what makes these animals reptiles and amphibians. Uh, so without any further ado, we will go ahead and get started. But I do want to remind everyone out there that you know in these crazy tough times, uh, anything really does help facilities like the Alligator Farm or other uh, zoos and aquariums and museums across the country. Uh, we do have a GoFundMe page and we are about tenth of a way there to our final goal. Uh, anything really helps, anything from a dollar uh, to ten dollars, right, really does help us feed our animals, make sure we can provide the best care for them on uh, daily. Uh, so again, without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and look at some of our reptiles that we brought here today. Uh, Frank, we're going to start off with some of our snakes. I think you have or got to meet one of our, uh, one of my favorite animals here, our Eastern Indigo Snake. This here is Jerry. I'm going to go ahead and hand him over to you if you would like to. How are you doing, Jerry? There you go. So Jerry here is an Eastern Indigo Snake. Looks like he has a little bit uh, <laughs> of go, uh, decor wrapped around him. Uh, Eastern Indigo Snakes are native to us here in Florida. Uh, and Frank, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, the snakes and their scales? Yeah, so scales on a snake are very interesting. They're different for every type of snake. Of course, you have different colors and different patterns. But some snakes have a killed pattern and some don't. They're almost like bird feathers. They're unique to each animal and each animal species. Uh, these guys, their scales are very separated. You, alligators are over there talking, it's pretty funny. These guys are very separated scales. You might see a diamondback might have scales like a, like a bird. They're kind of feathered over top of each other. Again, that's uh, just different patterns for different snakes. Something, one thing to pick up on. Yeah, that's awesome. And so for our reptiles, no matter what they are, they all have some type of scale or scale pattern. So as you can see here, this is a gopher tortoise hatchling. Uh, this hatchling here actually came to us as a rehabilitated animal. Um, it was found with the no longer use of its back two legs, so it, could, it was deemed non-releasable. So it was brought here to our collection so we could take the best care for this animal uh, and help teach people about gopher tortoises and their importance. And as Frank was talking about scales, right, even turtles have scales, but they're called a little something different. They're called scoots. And the scoots are all those little patterns on top of its shell. And just like snakes can shed their scales, right, our gopher tortoises can shed their scoots. Now, what does a scale look like on an alligator? Do you want to tell me? A uh, scale on an alligator is actually looks more like a, uh, a big white piece of armor, and we call those osteoderms. Uh, or scoot, and those are uh, something that the alligator uses for thermoregulation. There's your word of the day, thermoregulation. So those are basically like solar panels yeah. on their back. That's how they thermoregulate when they get out in the sun. Their blood circulates through little holes in them. That's how they get warm or cold. Okay, great, awesome. So we have scales, all right? We know scales cover all the bodies of our reptiles, right? Another thing that is extremely important uh, when it comes to identifying whether or not it is a reptile or not, is kind of what Frank Rob just said, their ability to thermoregulate or whether or not they are endothermic or ectothermic. Uh, could you tell me maybe what the difference is between endothermic and ectothermic? It's the difference is getting heat from the outside or heat from the inside. Do you make your own heat or do you pick up heat from the environment around you? Awesome. So I know these two species here, gopher tortoises and indigo snakes, have a pretty storied history. Um, a lot of people may not think of it, but they are actually best friends, right? Uh, if we look over here at our little wall painting, right, you'll actually see what an example of a burrow would look like. Gopher tortoises will actually live in the pine brush, and they will dig these extensive burrows, sometimes reaching uh, hundreds and hundreds of feet long. Now, what is really important about these burrows is not just that the gopher tortoises can, can, can get in there and lay their eggs, but the other animals that use them. All right. I believe some research has been done on the amount of animals or the different types of species that use these animals, and it's a pretty high number. It's over 200 now, they have documented. Over 200 they're, species. They're both keystone species for a reason. Yeah, that is awesome. So can you tell me maybe how, what the relationship is between the gopher tortoise and the indigo snake? Yeah, so the gopher tortoise makes the burrow. The indigo goes in there and uses that burrow for a spot to hide. He finds food in there, gopher mice, what, whatever might be in there. Occasionally, you do see indigo snakes that will eat maybe gopher tortoises. Okay. It does happen. I'm glad I'm holding uh, it over here. Yeah, for sure. It does. It's not very common, but it does happen. We've yeah. seen that on x-ray before. It's pretty neat stuff. But uh, they're 
a bear, their relationship is tied tied together. They're a keystone species for that reason. Uh, the gopher tortoise makes the burrow, then the ghost snake uses that burrow, and of course this guy eats everything else he comes across too. So he could even eat some of the predators of a gopher tortoise. Correct. Right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Awesome. I know this area is definitely prone to fire here in Florida. We are definitely used to uh, you know natural forest fires that kind of sweep through our pine savannas here. Um, and I'm pretty sure a lot of the species will use these burrows as refuge, right? Yes, uh, during a fire, that's one of the spots they go hide in while the, the fire comes through. Keeps oxygen for a while because it's further down there. It uh, awesome. works out pretty good for them. Yeah, so our gopher tortoise, our indigo snakes, two unlikely pairings, but uh, we're definitely happy to have these both here and teach, of course, you all about the importance of their relationships and their importance to our environment. But we also want to bring up our last type of animal that we're going to be talking about today, uh, which is, of course, our amphibians. A lot of people make that mistake that amphibians and reptiles are one and the same. Uh, for amphibians, they actually do not have scales that cover their body. They have a skin that is actually absorbent. If you want to come right over here, uh, we can take a look at one of our amphibian friends. Now, I'm not actually going to bring this animal out or touch it, because as I was saying, these amphibians do have a skin that is different than, say, the scales of our reptiles, right? This skin actually can absorb things through it, right? Um, there is a transmitted property that allows these animals to absorb moisture, right, which helps to keep them hydrated. Now, if I were to go and touch our amphibian, right, anything that on my hands, that amphibian can absorb, right? Uh, ultimately affecting that animal's like long-term livelihood. So we wanna make sure anytime that we're handling our amphibians, we always use gloves or we just try not to touch them at all. Or if we're ever out in our backyards or you're out in your backyard looking for amphibians or uh, reptiles, right? You always wanna keep about a six foot social distancing uh, guideline for these animals, right? And that's no matter what, uh, what time of the year it is, whether or not there is a iris or anything else, you always want to keep your distance when uh, dealing with our reptiles and amphibians because we are in their space, we are in their backyard. Okay. So I want to thank you guys again for joining us today on our amphibian reptile show. Uh, please tune back in at one o'clock. We are actually going to uh, see Chance the Snapper get fed and get a special reading from our friend Frank Rob. Um, and again, please look to our webpage for any ways you can help the alligator farm, whether it's through our GoFundMe page or some of our new animal adoptions as well. Thank you guys, and we'll see you next week at 12 o'clock. Hi everyone, and welcome back. Uh, as you can see, I'm joined by our friend Frank. Uh, and as well as some of our animal ambassadors. Uh, you probably recognize our two individuals here from earlier. We have our gopher tortoise uh, and happy Florida gopher tortoise day. And we also have our American alligator hatchling. Now, some of you might be familiar with this particular hatchling. He is actually part of the educator contest at the Otis Mason Elementary School one. Uh, his name is Buck Beak. So if you are from Otis Mason, you probably recognize this little hatchling from one of your classrooms. Um, so we just want to do a quick recap on everything that we talked about earlier. We talked about some of the descriptions or the characteristics of reptiles. We talked about their scale patterns and all the different types of scales that our different reptiles have. We also, so uh, again, the osteoderms, we have a little bio fact here, all right? And we also talked about very briefly, right? How it, uh, reptiles lay their eggs or how they reproduce. Uh, this is an American alligator egg I have right here. Uh, these eggs were actually collected from one of our individuals out in the park. Uh, they were not fertile though. Reptiles will sometimes lay eggs even though they will not be fertilized. Uh, so we're able to actually poke holes in either end of them just like you would for Easter. Happy Easter, that one's coming up here soon. Um, and blow out all of that yolk uh, to make a nice, what we call biofat. Um, and then finally, the th uh, third biggest kind of characteristic for our reptiles is the fact that they are uh, ectothermic, which means... It means they're the temperature of their surroundings. Yeah, yeah. which means they um, hold that same temperature. So Frank's going to talk a little bit about our alligators and what the ectothermic versus endothermic thing does for them. Sure. And, well, I'll get into nesting here a little bit real quick, too. Uh, these guys, a typical nest is between 28 and 48 little hatchlings, eggs. Uh, these little guys, it's about one in a hundred that makes it to four feet. So each one's a, pretty much a little miracle. If you see a big gator out somewhere in your backyard, he really is a little miracle. And talking about the thermal regulation or their, their temperature, uh, they use those osteoderms when they get on their back. That's the natural solar panel they have that's made there. 
to get warm or cold. Uh, it's a lot, of, a lot more than just an alligator that'll nest in an alligator nest too. It's a keystone species for, for many reasons. Uh, there's so many different types of turtles that'll nest in a nest with an alligator. Pretty, pretty mm -hmm. amazing stuff. A lot, a lot of stuff going on there. Awesome. Thank you. And this is just a reminder, you know, every day that we are here, we're working to make sure that our animals are having um, healthy diets, their medication, everything that they need uh, to make sure that they live healthy, uh, sustainable and long lives. Um, and anything really does help. So please go to our uh, website to figure out how you can help. Uh, Alligator Farm has been uh, participating and excelling in conservation for over 125 years. And with your help, we can uh, continue that for much, much longer. Uh, at one o'clock here, you're going to be meeting your old friend. Is that correct? Indeed. Yeah, I'll be uh, reading the coloring book to Chance the Snapper for sure, reading a storybook awesome. to him. So thank you guys for tuning in this week for our reptile and amphibian uh, backyard field trip. Again, at one o'clock, we'll be seeing Chance the Snapper and our friend Frank here. He's going to read a little story to Chance and we'll see a feeding demonstration as well. If you do have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. We can answer those at any time. Um, and if not, we hope to see you next week at 12 o'clock. Thank you guys and we hope to see you soon. Stay safe out there.